Hello, and welcome to today's episode of Books in the World, a presentation of the Cape Cod Writers Center. We have two books that we'll be talking about in this next half hour, and there's one name that's on both of them, Rick Beyer. Welcome to Books Thanks in the so World, much. Rick. Thanks so much for having me here. It's great to be here. They're totally different. Uh, the two books that you've brought in today, and both of them bearing your name. The first one in collaboration with, with Elizabeth Sayers. It's called The Ghost Army of World War II. And the subtitle tells it all, or t at least indicates it all. It says, how one top secret unit deceived the enemy with inflatable tanks, sound effects, and other audacious, audacious fakery. And the second book we'll get to in a little while. How did this book come about, Rick? Well, so this book came actually out of a documentary, a PBS documentary that I produced called The Ghost Army about this same unit. Uh, and that came out of uh, a conversation I had with somebody, I guess it must be 13 years ago now, whose uncle served in this uh, extraordinary World War II unit that was secret for many, many decades. Uh, and many people, I think, who uh, have studied World War II are familiar with the D-Day deception, where we were trying to fool the Germans about where the D-Day invasion would take place. But this is a very different story. This is an American unit of about 1,100 soldiers that operated uh, on the ground in Europe starting about a week after D-Day and conducting 21 different battlefield deceptions over the course of the war in Europe. And it's an incredible tale. <laughs> And it worked. It worked. Uh, many of these deceptions were bought by the Germans hook, line, and sinker. Uh, it's believed that this unit saved thousands of lives. I have literally talked to uh, uh, people who were tankers under Patton who said once they learned about what this unit did, they thought, wow, that, that unit might have helped save my life. So we, we really do believe they worked. All right, let's get back into how did it work and how did it save so the way it works is that the, the mission of this unit was deception, and in particular it's impersonation. So they're impersonating other, much larger American units to fool the Germans about where those units really are. Or did they fool American soldiers or officers as well? They often did, uh, as a collateral uh, of that, fool American units on either side of them who thought there was a real unit there, a real infantry division or armored division, when in fact uh, it was just fakery. So it's a multimedia deception. There's four kinds of deception that they're doing. Visual, with all these inflatable tanks and uh, artillery, inflatable trucks, all that type of stuff to fool enemy aerial reconnaissance. You have sound deception, sonic deception, where they had sound trucks. They had actually had half tracks equipped with 500 pound speakers so they could play at night the sounds of a division moving in down the roads, 20 miles down the road. So everybody, you know, miles around would think that, that a large number of trucks or tanks were moving in. They did radio deception as well. And they did uh, what they called special effects, which is essentially uh, 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 acting. It's fakery. It's setting up phony headquarters. It's putting on the patches of the unit that you're impersonating. It's going into town. Uh, you're going into town wearing the patch of the 75th Infantry Division, and you're going into the, the cafe a few miles behind the line and, and acting like you're really from that division. Or even, they even pretended to be, they had soldiers who would pretend to be generals. Of, of a division and drive them around on an inspection tour. I, I can just visualize a, a corporal or even a sergeant or a massive sergeant saying, listen, we'll put the badges, we'll put the pins on you and be a general. And if you're, if you're a career soldier, Wow. <laughs> well, and this is, um, you know, this is, 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 it sounds ridiculous. It sounds like something that could only be in a movie, and yet it really happened. What was the germ, the, the instance, where did it come from? Sure. So um, it was inspired, I think, in part by uh, tactical deceptions that the British had done in North Africa. So especially at the Battle of El Alamein, they did a, a 
tremendous deception called Operation Bertram to fool the Germans into thinking tanks were in one place when they really were someplace else. And there was an American officer serving in North Africa named Ralph Ingersoll, and he saw this, and then when he was working on doing planning for the upcoming invasion of Europe in 1943, he and another officer, Billy Harris, kind of took that idea and said, you know, kind of how can we go one better? How can we do something even more than this? What if we can create a unit that can stage these deceptions sort of on demand and then pack it up, drive away, and then be able to do it again? And that's did, how it started. Who did they have to convince? I mean, we're, I'm just going back to the original. Uh, Ingersoll had this idea borrowed from the British. Uh, who did he have to convince to say, Give me the men, give me the equipment, we'll build the sound barriers, we'll fake photographs, we'll... Where... Well, at the time, they, they were the commander uh, in late 1943 of American forces in England was a general named Jake Devers. And so he had to be convinced. And then Jake Devers is replaced uh, in uh, December 1943 by a fellow you've probably heard of named Dwight Eisenhower. I've heard of him. You've heard of him. <laughs> Eisenhower had to be convinced. Eisenhower was so convinced that this was important that his staff, once he became the commanding general, sent orders back to the United States that this unit be given the highest priority so that they could get it to Europe in time to be able to put it into action once they had done the invasion. But you think about it, it's a crazy idea, and they had to convince those high-ranking generals uh, that they wanted to do this. And where did they find the men who would be able to pull this off? Well, when the Army, the Army put this unit together in January 1944, and they essentially took pre-existing units and mushed them all together to be in the in the 23rd Headquarters Special well, Troops. You mentioned, Rick, you mentioned 1944. The uh, Americans were in the war as of December 7th, 41. Right. So there were battles going on. There were diversion of forces all over uh, Europe, in fact, all over the world. Uh, it seems kind of late to get something started. And the, especially with military procedures. Well, they, right. And so, so it was late in the sense that they came up with the idea of doing this and then they had about six months to get it ready and get it into action in Europe. Um, and uh, so that's why they took pre-existing units. So there was, for example, they took a pre-existing camouflage battalion, the 603rd Camouflage engineers. And they said, instead of doing camouflage now, you're, you're working with these inflatables. So instead of hiding things, you're trying to make it appear that things that aren't there are there. Things that aren't there are there. Right. And so that you're trying to make it seem like there really are tanks there where there are no tanks there. And the tanks were made of? And rubber, inflatable rubber. They were, they they were, were balloons. balloons. They were balloons. Fake, uh, fake tanks. Yes. You have a picture of a tank on the front of your book, Ghost Army of World War II. And, well, it looks like a tank, sort of, with a canvas cover instead of the hard metal. Right. And in this particular picture, the cannon that comes out of it is a tube that really isn't rigid as a cannon would be. It almost looks uh, bent. But the important thing is not how it looks from 20 feet away. It's how it looks from a plane that's flying a few thousand feet in the air. And does it cast the right shadows? And is it the right dimensions in the right shape? And so these dummies are designed to fool somebody at a distance, not, definitely not to fool somebody close up. So they had these different units that, that existed already. They put them together uh, to create the Ghost Army. They had to, as you say, they had to train them very fast uh, because by May of 1944, they're on a ship headed for England. So that's how fast this came together. And they didn't, the other interesting thing is they didn't really have a doctrine. So, so military units have a doctrine that they operate under. You know, what's the plan that we're operating oh, under? Yes. They didn't really have a deception doctrine for this unit. It was such a new thing. They 
had to kind of create it as they went along. So they, they were, had to make up their own doctrine as they went along. They were in procedure. They were doing stuff, but they were winging it. Yes, well put. They were winging it, especially at the beginning. And it probably wasn't until their fifth or sixth deception that they were really starting to really do it well. All right, let's take a few of the deceptions. First of all, there are the balloons that are in the shape of tanks, uh, trucks, all sorts of military gear, even a few airplanes. And what would they do with them? Well, they would create, I, 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 I think of it as 3D painting on the landscape. So you would, uh, if you want to pretend, uh, let's say in an area, uh, you know, we're in uh, 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 Dennis Port here, if we want to pretend that there uh, is a tank division here, we're going to park some of these things in different places, sort of half hidden by the woods, half hidden by camouflage, but but badly camouflaged, so pieces of them are sticking out. So that if somebody's flying over us here, they'll see some of them. They won't see all of them, but they'll see some of them. And they'll say, okay, well, wow, there's, there's tanks here. What's going on? You know, what kind of unit is that? But it's not even that simple. Because um, if you are driving a, a tank, a Sherman tank weighs 40 tons. It makes a heck of an impression in the ground. It leaves no. tracks, okay? If you have a 90-pound inflatable dummy, it does not leave no. any tracks. <laughs> yeah. So they had to have a combat uh, engineering company with three bulldozers that would make the tank tracks. So you are literally, it's like a, a, a trompe l'oeil painting. You are making something that looks real, uh, that in fact is, has all the cues, all the visual cues of being real, but is not real at all. And, and that's how they did where, the visual where deception. Where would they physically create where? These? So, so, so oftentimes it was um, near the front lines, but not at the very, very front line. So it might be... Uh, it was sort of ready and back up. Right, so it might be three to five uh, miles behind the front line. Sometimes the closest that they got was about a half mile to the front. Uh, so sometimes they got that close. And it really it was different every deception because it depended on what the deception message was. Are we trying to say that this is a unit that's about to attack? Or we, do we want the enemy to think that this is a unit that's moving in in reserve? What are we trying to convince the enemy? That would tell us exactly where to put things and how close to the front. Now, as I read your book, The Ghost Army of World War II, Rick, uh, they implied all this. How did they know that it was working? Um, what other methods, you mentioned very quickly, Rick, of uh, people going into taverns, wearing different army patches. What coordinated them? How did they get the word out, or how did they hope to get the word out to enemy German forces? So you've asked a bunch of good questions there all at once. So let, <laughs> let me try to unpack no, that a little bit. We don't have five hours to got, condense it. <laughs> let me get my lecture uh, ready to go. Um, so th the overall philosophy, first of all, is this. We know that the enemy receives information, intelligence from different channels, we'll call them. One might be visual, what they see. One might be what they hear. One might be what they hear in the radio, what they can listen to in the radio. One is what their spies are telling them. So that's four channels of information. So what we're going to try to do, and we being the Americans and the 12th U.S. Army Group Special Plans Branch, is we're going to try to construct a story, a scenario that we want to sell. What's the fake story we want to sell? Then we're going to assign the ghost army to carry that out. So let's say that the fake story is that the 6th Armored Division is moving in just south of Luxembourg City. That was one of the deceptions they did. So now we are going to try to use all these different means to sell this one fake story. We don't know what the Germans are going to hear. Are they going to get all four sources of information? Are they only going to get bits and pieces of them? We're trying to give them just enough that it, uh, that it convinces them. And keep in mind, it only has to convince them 
you know, even if we've got them convinced for a day, even if we've got them convinced for half a day or that it might be happening, it might be just enough to throw them off, to delay an attack, to, to make a move that it's going to assist American forces. And so then when the real units are, are trying to attack, uh, maybe the Germans have moved troops away from there. And that's how you sort of save lives uh, and have an impact. So the enemy would diverse its forces that's your hope. On, on the rumors that they heard from this ghost army. Right. So that would be the hope, that they would move their forces towards you. So in essence, the ghost army is saying, attracting attention. Hey, look at us. You know, come attack us. Come shoot at us. They're trying to draw enemy attention and enemy fire. And that literally is their mission. Well, <laughs> you know, Not for just, the faint of heart, right? Well, and, and it worked. And it worked. So they did 21 deceptions. We know uh, several of them worked very, very well, including their last deception. And captured German records confirm that. Uh, their last deception, they were uh, basically trying to impersonate two American divisions and make them seem like they were crossing the Rhine River one place, where they were really crossing the Rhine River 10 miles to the north. So we know that that one worked. We know that some other ones worked very well. Some of them we're not so sure of. But we also know that the Germans never figured out that a deception unit was operating against them. How long after the war did the word get out? Or was it rapid? So the Pentagon kept the, uh, the official history and other documents related to this unit secret for 50 years, to about 1996. Now, there was some news coverage, uh, a brief news coverage in 1945 and a couple of other times in the interim because uh, soldiers occasionally talked to reporters, things were written, but the Army was really still trying to keep it uh, relatively under wraps until the mid-90s. And I think the reason for that is that um, they wanted to keep secret, not so much the idea that we did this, not so much, oh, we used inflatable tanks, or oh, we used radio deception, but how they organized it and how they made it all work together. So that they, their hope was that they, they, you don't want the enemy to try to be able to figure out how they can um, uh, you know, decode the message, right? So how, they, how, how can they figure out what the telltale signs of the deception unit are? They don't want that to happen. And we thought we might have to use it, let's say, in the Cold War. But I think once the Cold War uh, had gone away and once technology had moved beyond a lot of this stuff, then they felt they could declassify it. Oh. One thing I liked about, as I finished reading your book, Rick, was that you did a follow-up for the survivors or for the stories that were available about this whole gang of people. And it gives a sort of a... a a glorious interception of the characters involved, as well as wrapping up your book. Well, I love that when books do that. So I wanted to do it too, right? So what happens to all these people yeah. after the story? And it's especially interesting because, and we've hardly had time to talk about this, many of these soldiers were artists. Many in the visual camouflage, the visual deception unit, were artists. Some of them had amazing artistic careers. Uh, Bill Blass, the fashion designer. Yes. Ellsworth Kelly, the minimalist painter. Uh, Arthur Kane, who took that great photo of all the jazz musicians on the stoop in Harlem in 1957. I remember that picture. And many other talented artists. So part of, and, and of course I've met now um, uh, and interviewed many of the people in this unit and I wanted to say, you know, what happened to them and where are they now? And, you know, sadly of the 1,100 men in the unit, there are only about 20 who are still alive. Uh, because um, it's so many years it's ago. It's so many years ago. The oldest surviving veteran is 103. So we do everything we can to honor them. And, and we do, I'll just mention that we have a nonprofit, the Ghost Army Legacy Project. People can check it out online to see how we're trying to honor and preserve the legacy of these soldiers. Now we're saving part of our ever so short half hour today on Books in the World. I'm talking too much, that's Be the problem. Because your name shows up, Rick Byer, on another book. That, uh, Totally different, total different story. But still history, still history. It's still history. It's called Rivals Unto Death, the story of Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr. And 
is, well, I knew with the basic history that they teach in schools that, okay, they had a duel. They did? But, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, okay, they did, yes, sorry. But it's much more than that. Well, it's interesting because we all know there's a duel, and we all know that Aaron Burr shot Alexander Hamilton, and now there's also a musical that tells the story. And Hamilton, you know, Hamilton musical right. is so extremely popular. But what is interesting is that they really had a rivalry that went on for 30 years. Yeah, they battled all the time. What was the cause of their dissension? One well, they, the they other? actually went back and forth between fighting and being friends. Uh, and allies. I think it began with Washington, interestingly enough, with George Washington. They both had a chance to serve on his staff, and it works out very differently. Aaron Burr is on the staff for 10 days, leaves Washington's staff in 1776, uh, and, um, and ends up with a lifelong enmity towards Washington. Hamilton joins Washington's staff during the Revolution the following year, 1777, uh, serves as his aide for four years, becomes his lifelong protege. So that's the first kind of rock between them, that Hamilton is one of those Washington supporters and Burr is one of those Washington skeptics. And it kind of drives them to different political parties. And then they are uh, lawyers in New York, you know, battling each other. They're political rivals, they're courtroom rivals. Uh, so you have a lot of different things feeding into that. They, the, in the political rivalry, they ran for office. Some of them were successful in chasing the same office, which meant that the other person, either Hamilton or Burr, would be the loser in that particular case. And they never actually ran for the exact same office, but sometimes there were elections in which they were kind of running their party's election, let's say for state legislature, and one of them's the campaign manager for the Federalists, and one of them is the campaign manager for the Democrat Republicans, and right, so somebody's always a winner and loser there. And when Aaron Burr becomes a senator from New York, the person he defeats in that Senate race is Philip Schuyler, who's Alexander Hamilton's father-in-law. So that's got to hurt as well. And then I, I posit that there's a, there's a real, um, sort of almost a spiritual difference between them. Um, Alexander Hamilton uh, considers politics to be a, a sacred mission. Okay? He had fixed principles. He's going to argue for these with all the passion he can muster. And um, Aaron Burr looks on politics as a career. It's a, it's a chance to get ahead, make your mark, and his allegiances are much more flexible. And that drives Alexander Hamilton crazy because he can't understand it. So then he starts to think that Burr has no character whatsoever. Uh, and Burr starts to think that Hamilton is just a zealot and kind of it goes from there. Rick Barr, our time is going so quickly in this so short half hour. The actual duel was challenged about a week before it took place at a gathering of all the uh, what top political parties. Well, the... act so actually, they, they, the challenge came about three weeks before the duel. About three weeks. But one week before the duel, a great scene, Burr and Hamilton are literally sitting side by side at a July 4th dinner. And it's, it's how I opened the book, because it's impossible to imagine how can they be sitting at the, side by side like we are now, conversing, when they're intent uh, in a couple of weeks to one week later to go out and shoot it out with each other. Yeah, you know, is there any record, Rick, of who said what to whom as far as, okay, it's time, we're going to have a duel? It's all in writing. It's all in writing. There's this exchange of notes. Uh, it's all been preserved. It's Burr who essentially challenges Hamilton, uh, and he does so because of uh, uh, he received uh, word of something that Hamilton had allegedly said at a dinner party, and Burr was inquiring about the details of what he said. The thing is that the actual cause of the duel is ridiculously minor. It really is not very important. So to really understand it, I think you have to understand the 30 years that leads up to it and kind of how Burr had kind of s snapped over what Alexander Hamilton was doing. And they met a few weeks later after this argument or after this challenge and Burr shot Hamilton. Right, they were 30 feet apart. Uh, the seconds cried, present. Uh, 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 
there's a great argument over who shot first, who fired first, but there's no argument over the fact that uh, Hamilton's bullet missed and Aaron Burr's bullet didn't. And talk about shot. Our time is shot this afternoon. <laughs> and there fun, are though. two books, both of which deserve much more time than we were able to devote to Bring them. me back. I'm ready. <laughs> we could do many, many more hours on The Ghost Army of World War II, written by our guest Rick Beyer and with his co-author Elizabeth Sayers, and The Rivals Under Death, the story of Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr. Rick Beyer, thank you for coming in Thank today. you so much. The time only went too quickly, but I suggest that you take time to find these two books and play many of Towers to read through and learn much more. And we thank you for viewing today's episode of Books in the World, a presentation of the Cape Cod Writers' Center. Thank you for viewing. Not done yet. Okay. Oh, oh, yeah. oh, oh, you did. Oh, you, oh, you did. Thank you, Bob. We've got a 15 year. Oh, 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 oh. oh, congratulations. Oh, thank you. 15 years, that's awesome. Yeah. I thought we were going to have to sing you happy birthday, but I guess uh, it's more we sing you happy 15 years. I don't yes. know that tune, but. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I can watch the camera. Everybody up. There's a wisdom for us. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you Here all. Comes Natty. Good. Uh, you're putting all this in the same program? I, yeah. yeah we're just, no wonder the percent. time went quickly. Yeah, yeah, it did. <laughs> a little faster than usual. Yeah. Yeah. So thank this you is all. your. This is your. Did yeah. you say it's your it's last, la your last <laughs> interview? <laughs> So yes. I was so bad that you quit after me? <laughs> <laughs> or I was so great that you didn't think you could top that? Yeah. Which is it? <laughs> we, we, we tried to do our own deception. That was why the cues went yeah. so fast. Well, thank you all. I could see he was surprised by that, you know, <laughs> that the time was going. Where is it going? Well, now we know. Well, we'll end this again with thank yous all the way around. And it went only too quickly. I called one day and they said, uh, can you stand behind the camera and focus? And I did. And the lady who was doing this program prior to that became quite ill. So with my background in radio and TV, they said, all right, sit there and talk to somebody. <laughs> and suddenly it's 15 years later, and I'm going to take a break for a while and enjoy these cakes. And thank you all, 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 all. I, I stand to thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there finally an ending to this cake? <laughs> Who's in the control room? It's Amy. Thank you. See, you have a little chocolate bunny.